You're a wizard, Harry. Harry Potter, the boy who lived. Casey, it is about time we got around to this series. Oh, I know, Clint. The J.K. Rowling novels published from 1997 to 2007 were immediate hits and didn't take long to land on the screen. So let's do it right. Let's look at the whole thing at once. None of this one book at a time business. We're talking the whole series of books compared to the entire film franchise. But because there are seven books and eight movies, we're going to break it into three parts. Seven books and eight movies and three parts? Ugh, this could have been so much easier. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, no restraint on spoilers, here comes part one, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Chamber of Azkaban. What's, What's the, the difference, difference, eh? You got your Cockney accent all dusted off in, Casey? I do not, no. Well, that's all right, because I'm not using mine either. Oh, thank God. So, right off the bat, the books and movies start off in different places. The Sorcerer's Stone's opening chapter follows Vernon Dursley, Harry Potter's straight-up abusive uncle as he goes about his normal, very non-magical day. But Vernon notices strangely dressed people celebrating in the streets, hordes of owls flying, and even bumps right into a man who shares the joy of you-know-who's demise. It's not until later that night that Dumbledore, McGonagall, and Hagrid leave the freshly orphaned Harry Potter on the doorstep of Number 4 Privet Drive. The movie begins straight away with the wizard and witch leaving Harry with the only family he's got left, even though they're stupid idiot muggles. While the scene plays out basically the same in both mediums, it's interesting the movie decided to lop off Vernon Dursley's day. While the movie drops you in with our lead characters, magical characters, the book instead opens on the muggle world, a world that we as readers are familiar with. The magical world then slowly seeps in as Vernon sees glimpses of it on the street. This allows the reader time to let the magical world seep in as well, but the movie is best served to open from the perspective of its main characters. From there, the Sorcerer's Stone moves along to the same beats in both the book and the movie. We see Harry's brutal childhood as Ward of the Dursleys living in the cupboard under the stairs, his discovery of the wizarding world along with his very famous place in it, making both friends and enemies at Hogwarts, all the way to discovering Voldemort hiding on the back of Professor Quirrell's noggin. Of course, the usual liberties of adaptation are taken throughout the movie. For example, Hagrid picks Harry up on his birthday on July 31st and whisks him off to Diagon Alley and to King's Cross Station to catch the Hogwarts Express the very next day. Which completely skips the month of August, by the way. A month which is not skipped in the book that finds Harry returning to the Dursleys where he's almost completely ignored until school starts on September 1st. But that's time spent in the muggle world. The movie chooses to skip it in favor of devoting more screen time to details of the wizarding world. You know, where they shop, how they bank, what their candy's like, important stuff. Of course, the brilliance of J.K. Rowling is learning about these everyday wizarding activities doubled as important plot points in Harry's investigation into the Sorcerer's Stone, i.e. Hagrid picking up the stone from Gringotts, learning about Nicholas Flamel from a chocolate frog box, and so on. The important point here is the plot, as well as the main characters and their arcs, stay intact from the book to the movie. Harry is brave and loyal to his friends, Ron is well on his way to finding some self-worth, and Hermione discovers that book learning ain't everything. And more important things. The one character, however, whose scenes get trimmed and ultimately loses a little something is Draco Malfoy. The book features a chapter called The Midnight Duel, in which Draco baits Harry and Ron into meeting in the trophy room for a wizard's duel at midnight. However, Draco had no intention of ever going, only to set them up to be caught out of Gryffindor House at night. A real douchey move. The book also has a lot more additional Draco shit talking in fact, Ron finally snaps and lays him out at one of Gryffindor's Quidditch matches. And while the entire Quidditch match against Hufflepuff is left out of the movie, losing this much of Draco's antagonism in the first film will start to add up as we go through the rest. Of course, the movie still paints Draco as an entitled little sh** who is clearly the bad guy, and Tom Pelton's performance, which is probably the best out of all the kids in the movie, really sells him as Harry's primary foil. But it's still in a, the viewer's gonna know this guy's Harry's primary foil, so we can use a little shorthand kind of way. But outside of that, the story of the Sorcerer's Stone proceeds with Harry and his friends discovering Fluffy, the three-headed guard dog, learning about Nicholas Flamel and the Elixir of Life, and besting the Devil's Snare, the Flying Keys, and the giant game of Wizard's Chess on his way to confronting Lord Voldemort himself. And with very few twists and turns aside, the movie does basically the same thing. The changes made to the movie actually seem to make it a cleaner retelling of the novel. For example, Draco sees Harry, Ron, and Hermione in Hagrid's hut with a baby dragon and immediately runs to tattle on them, unwittingly getting detention for himself as well, which sets up their journey into the Forbidden Forest to find an injured unicorn. In the book, however, Draco sees everybody with the baby dragon. 
Then weeks go by while Harry and the gang hatch a plan to smuggle the dragon to Ron's brother Charlie in Romania, nervously anticipating Draco tattling on them. And finally, when the knight comes to ship the dragon off, Draco tries to spring another trap for them to be caught out of bed, only to be caught himself and given detention. However, Harry and Hermione are so relieved to be rid of the dragon, they get careless and end up in detention as well, which sets up their journey into the Forbidden Forest to find an injured unicorn. See, my way is cleaner. Well, it's not your way, it's the screenwriter Point who... is, the movie did an admirable job of keeping basically everything in, and in fact telling the same story in a more efficient way. By making the plot cleaner, the film adaptation was allowed to keep all of the details that fleshed out and made real the world we'll be inhabiting for seven more films. And that, my dear Casey, brings us to Year Two at Hogwarts, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. Wait, why'd you do it so spooky? I don't know. Felt right. Okay, fair enough. The Chamber of Secrets picks up right where the Sorcerer's Stone leaves off in both mediums. Harry is once again stuck in the Dursley's house like a prisoner when Dobby the house elf shows up determined to prevent Harry from returning to Hogwarts. Then Ron and his misfit brothers Fred and George show up in an enchanted flying car to rescue him, bringing him back to the Weasleys' home before heading off to school. Again, the movie fast forwards past much of the month leading up to Harry's second year at Hogwarts. Because the second installment in the series is designed to build upon the first, the movie keeps only what it needs to further explore the wizarding world. So the movie keeps things like traveling by flu powder, which we hadn't seen before, while cutting things from the book like Harry practicing Quidditch at the Burrow with the Weasley boys, which we have seen before. We do also get to meet Gilderoy Lockhart, the celebrity wizard set to be the new Defense Against the Dark Arts professor. In the book, he announces his new post in the bookstore, but the movie saves that reveal for the first day of class. Me. The movie also rearranges a few days' worth of conversations at the burrow into one scene at the breakfast table, choosing to put much less emphasis on the raids Mr. Weasley is carrying out at the Ministry. Skipping much of their discussion about Mr. Weasley's job policing the misuse of muggle artifacts does have an effect that trickles down to the Malfoy family, which once again gets mildly shortchanged in the deal. While the movie finds Harry shooting out the wrong grate in the flu network and winding up in Nocturne Alley, he quickly stumbles into Hagrid, who sets him back on his way safely with the Weasleys. In the book, though, Harry first overhears Draco and his father, Lucius Malfoy, attempting to sell suspicious items, fearing one of Mr. Weasley's raids could find some questionable and dark magical artifacts. But because the movie cuts this thread entirely, we lose a bit of the adversarial relationship between the Malfoys and our heroes. Granted, it's only one bit. The Malfoys are still entitled shits, mind you. Losing the political nature of the Arthur Weasley Lucius Malfoy rivalry allows the movie to focus on some of the darker ideas present in the story. Underneath everything else, the Chamber of Secrets deals with issues like racism and slavery. Dobby is bound to serve one family forever. The chamber itself was built over a thousand years ago by Salazar Slytherin, the pureblood advocate founding member of Hogwarts. The movie has Professor McGonagall explain the legend, while the book uses Professor Binns, the ghost who teaches history of magic, which is one instance where the book version makes way more sense. I was wondering if you could tell us about the Chamber of Secrets. Either way, the story is based around the discrimination of the so-called mudbloods by the so-called purebloods. While the adaptation is littered with little trims that the plot in the name of efficiency like the Sorcerer's Stone, the movie does not lose the more grown-up allegorical themes. One function of the second entry into the Harry Potter franchise is to get slightly more adult. The darker elements, like the monstrous snake-like basilisk that wants to rip flesh from bone, the bald-faced racism of the Malfoys, and the decidedly bloodier and dangerous climactic fight, they all serve to bridge the gap into the subsequent, more dramatic Harry Potter adventures. And the smaller changes to the mechanics of the plot become irrelevant. Like the fact that in the movie, Harry and Ron's voices don't change when they drink the polyjuice potion, a difference that becomes more troubling and inconsistent later in the series. Maybe they did it not to confuse the audience, or maybe it was so Hermione didn't have to sound like a cat. Who knows? Either way, it doesn't matter much in the context of the series. Yeah, why doesn't she sound like a cat? Yeah, I don't know. Point is, Sorcerer's Stone and the Chamber of Secrets are more or less the same from book to movie. Efficient and direct translations of the short books made for slightly longer than average movies. And the world of Hogwarts School for Witchcraft and Wizardry is richly set up. We understand what the stakes are and what the fight for Harry and his friends will be moving forward. But let's get a year older, shall we? And move on to Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. Caban. You're uh, sticking to that spooky voice then? Maybe you should worry about your own lines. The third Harry Potter opens the way they all do. Harry's stuck under the thumb of the Dursleys. The book finds him smuggling his wand and a few textbooks up to his room and hiding them under the floorboards to do some secret summer homework. 
<coughs> nerd. Harry also gets a handful of birthday wishes from his friends and a book from Hagrid, the toothy and dangerous Monster Book of Monsters. Rawr. But the film skips all of that in favor of a cold open with Harry secretly practicing Lumos Maximus in his bedroom while infuriating his stupid muggle uncle that we hate. The movie eschews some of the let's get caught up housekeeping in order to more firmly establish Harry as a rebellious teen coming into his own. From there, Prisoner of Azkaban hustles through many of the same beats. Harry's horrible Aunt Marge shows up, talks shit about Harry's parents, and then Harry gets straight up pissed and inflates her to Thanksgiving Day Parade levels of floating obesity. Bye, Auntie. Then he bolts, running away from number four Privet Drive and encountering a big scary <gasps> before being picked up by the night bus. Welcome to the night bus. It's on the night bus where Harry learns about Sirius Black's escape from Azkaban before being dropped off at famed wizard pub, the Leaky Cauldron. The only significant part of the book that's cut from this section is a scene in which Harry overhears Mr. and Mrs. Weasley discussing Sirius Black before Mr. Weasley brings it up with Harry at the train station the next day. The movie skips straight to Mr. Weasley telling Harry directly of Sirius' supposed intentions to murder him. And kill me. Once again, the screenwriters decided what to cut based on a thematic decision to get a little older, to treat Harry with a little more emotional maturity. As soon as Harry heads off to school, he encounters a Dementor as well as their new Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher on the Hogwarts Express. And the first days of class proceed without change as well. To omen of death. It isn't until their first Defense Against the Dark Arts class when things change slightly. Instead of allowing the Bogger to change into a Dementor in front of Harry, Professor Lupin steps in before it has a chance to. But even then, Snape filling in for Lupin and assigning a paper on recognizing werewolves, the Quidditch match, and Harry's injuries at the hands of the Dementors all make it on screen. Some of Harry's other classes and Quidditch practices, as well as his stay in the hospital ward, are left out. Aside from changing the location of the conversation during which Harry overhears his professors discussing Sirius Black's relationship to Harry, the movie matches up with the book pretty well from there. Harry learns about the Patronus charm, the kids uncover the truth about Peter Pettigrew and Scabbers after chasing Sirius to the Shrieking Shack. Then Harry and Hermione use the Time Turner to save both Sirius and Buckbeak the Hippogriff in the climactic sequence. Expecto Patronum! The one major bit of info the movie leaves out is the identity of Mooney, Wormtail, Padfoot, and Prongs. The Messers are credited as creators of the Marauder's map in the film, and Lupin clearly knows what the map is and how to use it. But the fact that it was Lupin, Sirius, Peter Pettigrew, and Harry's own father James is not mentioned at all. One of the most emotionally charged moments in the entire series is when Harry realizes that his Patronus manifests itself as a stag, and makes the connection to his father, Prongs. The movie, on the other hand, has Harry mistaking his own Patronus for his father. Of course, this is cleared up with just a little bit of timey-wimey time travel. The purpose of this difference is no doubt one of economy. Explaining all that takes up valuable screen time in a movie based on a book that's a good hundred pages longer than the first two entries. The spirit of the novel, however, remains intact. You helped uncover the truth. You saved an innocent man from a terrible fate. It made a great deal of difference. While the book sees Harry learning more about his parents, the movie version focuses on Harry coming into his own as an adolescent and growing confident in his own abilities to face what he must in the coming years. So while the mechanics of the plot differ slightly and an entire Quidditch match is once again cut, the Prisoner of Azkaban hangs on to the important parts of Harry and his friends' growth as young wizards. Do you want to move a bit closer? Huh? Ron and Hermione's burgeoning romance is also featured more predominantly in the movie than in the book, which might not actually be a difference. Seeing the accidental hand-holding and awkward interactions on screen just brings the flirtation to the forefront. We'd also be remiss if we didn't mention the Malfoys again here. The movie version of Draco is largely comic relief. He goes from snarling racist in Chamber of Secrets to sniveling leader of a Three Stooges-like band of physical comedians being bested by snowballs in Hermione's right cross, only to return to his straight-up evil nature later on in the series. But that's for, well, later in our series. Hope you enjoyed part one of our adventure into the wizarding world with Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Chamber of Azkaban. Make sure to like and subscribe and stick around Cinefix for part two. Harry Potter and the Goblet of the Phoenix. So that voice is still spooky to you. Absolutely. Right, Harry? Spooky. Thanks, dude.